so so far we've discussing been discussing mostly fintech developments close to home, but our next speaker, who's a seasoned entrepreneur, has spent more than 30 years bringing new innovations to market in sub-Saharan Africa as well as the US. Barry Gerson is the CEO of IceCash, an electronic payment platform in Zimbabwe. Barry is going to inspire us with stories on how to innovate banking solutions in a near cashless economy. Give a warm welcome to Barry Gerson. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Barry Gerson. I'm a South African and by some sheer dint of fate ended up doing business in Zimbabwe. And for the last three years, my wife and I have actually been living there. Now, I guess seeing pictures of elephants at a conference like this is a little unusual, but um, so is the story. All of this started back in 2009, where I was still licking my wounds and trying to come to terms with the demise of my most recent startup, a mortgage origination business in a call center, which got wiped out in 2008, and went to Old Mutual, which is the largest insurance company in South Africa. Uh, a friend of mine heads up the non-insurance part of that and made a presentation to them to see if we could originate mortgages for them, because we really had developed a great system. At the end of a short and punchy presentation, is it not working? At the end of the short and punchy presentation, he said two words to me. I can't, I can't repeat them exactly, but the first word started with an F and the second word was off. <laughs> he says, I never want to see a mortgage again in my life. What we really want to do is we want to get into this mobile money like they've done in Kenya. I was totally unaware of all of this, went back to our office, Googled what M-Pesa was doing and said, wow, this has to be the most amazing opportunity. In our research, we came across two graphs like this, and it was quite obvious. There were very few bank accounts in Africa, many cell phones, and the, the penetration was escalating out of, you know, off the charts, literally. Now, you don't have to be Warren Buffett to work out there's got to be a ton of money to be made here. Well, I guess Warren Buffett also saw these two graphs and didn't invest but I knew better. So we looked at this thing, and we were really naive, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and we said, how are we really going to make this thing work? Made a lot of bad decisions, but two of them were very good. In retrospect, had we not done it, I would not be standing here today talking to you. The first thing we did was we said, we looked at M-Pesa, which is a P2P thing, money in, money out. Um, it's a really remittance uh, thing. They've done very, very well. They've made a ton of money. But we said, well, we need to do something that's beyond that. And it really needs to be a comprehensive core banking system, um, which we then did and put it into our, our planning. The second thing we said, we need to develop this in-house because if we buy something off the shelf, our future growth and development, we didn't know what it was going to be, would be dependent on our supplier's pipeline. And we all know that money talks in a situation like that, and we wouldn't win that race. So off we did, developed it in-house. I then spent two years running around South Africa trying to secure a sponsor bank, because we needed a banking license to do this. The big banks were really scared of this. Uh, they saw this as threatening their market, cannibalizing their customers. And the smaller banks really didn't understand this at all. So going around, I happened to be at a function where sitting at a table similar to this, the man on the left was from Malawi. He owned an M&O over there. And the man on my right was the chairman of a bank in Zimbabwe. Both were very interested in what we were doing. Long story short, we ended up doing a joint venture with the bank in Zimbabwe. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I got to Zimbabwe. So, Zimbabwe itself, I'd been as a tourist but never doing business, um, really is a most beautiful country. Uh, that's Vic Falls. I highly recommend, if you haven't been there, you should go. It's one of the seven wonders of the world. The people are so nice. Uh, it's the most literate nation in Africa. 
Um, they've been through a torrid time with almost 40 years of a very oppressive dictatorship, uh, hyperinflation, whatever, and they really have managed to, to get by with this. I've had quite some interesting encounters. I've met a couple of big shots along the way, some in the bush, some in the cities. And I think I just need to give you a little bit of background to what's happened economically in Zimbabwe so that you can appreciate how they've now ended up in an almost cashless situation. Um, starting with the land reform, Zimbabwe went from being the, the breadbasket of southern Africa to the basket case of the world. Um, farms were taken and not used, and they had to obviously import. Uh, government overspent, and they ended up with this hyperinflation. Um, November 14, what was it, 96 trillion percent, that's 21 zeros. At this stage, prices are more than doubling every day, and it was absolutely hectic. The government was printing money like there was no tomorrow. He has a hundred trillion dollar note. You think Donald Trump is rich? Fake news. <laughs> I got about three of those in my pocket. <laughs> so, of course, at some stage, the music had to stop, and the fin worldwide financial crisis was probably a good time. And I think what really did happen was the printing press was so overheated that it melted into a blob of steel. The Minister of Finance stood up on the 14th of November and said, fellow Zimbabweans, whatever's in your bank account's been zeroed, but the good news, whatever you owe the bank has also been zeroed. And basically, they wiped out the whole banking system, demonetized their, their currency, and everybody thought it was the end of the world. Well, guess what happened the next day? The sun rose in the east, predictably. And like manna from heaven, suddenly dollars appeared on the street. <laughs> Zimbabweans are so resourceful. They didn't miss a day's trading. And from going from this hugely inflationary environment, inflation was down to zero. Everything was dollars, but there was no central bank involved. The dollar notes soon started to look like the one on the top, literally held together by dirt and grit. Um, but there was an absolute euphoria in the economy, and people were trading, and it was really good. But, you know, like all things, things come to an end. Over time, what happened is that the uh, government with overspending started mopping up liquidity, and dollars became fewer and fewer. And where we are today, it's very, very hard to find any currency on the street. Everything is done electronically, and I'll explain some of the things that have been done there. Anyway, back to me. I arrived in Zimbabwe 2011. The honeymoon was over, but it was a cash economy. You arrived there with your visa card, you couldn't use it. Everything was paid in cash, dirty dollar bills. Sometimes I'll just leave them no matter how many they gave me back. I didn't want to touch them. And we now launched this mobile platform. And I really was totally fixated with this VAS, the value-added services. I wanted to offer free, almost free banking or very, very low-cost banking. And we'd make our money selling airtime. Why wouldn't people do it? It was such an obvious thing to me. Well, as the slide says, it was really a mere mirage. Um, I would really, I guess, kid myself saying, well, we can make between two to three dollars per month from a customer buying and selling the airtime, and you know we've got a hundred thousand that would be you know two hundred thousand dollars a month. And God, if you had a million things, we'd have this, and it just didn't be. Along the way came Econet, the largest MNO in Zim, and they launched a thing called EcoCash. They copied exactly what Impesa was doing and did it very successfully, and today it's the second most successful um, mobile wallet solution in Africa and probably the world. Um, that's why I'd be aware of what Ian's saying. Telcos can do it. Um, that, unfortunately, was the death knell for us because they had a far bigger budget, and they had seven million subscribers whom they could communicate with freely. An SMS doesn't cost a telco any money, and I just knew we were in trouble, big trouble. When I looked at what we had, we had a very powerful system that we had developed. And we could um, really do things and customize things. So 
Surely that must differentiate us. And the aha moment was, they said, instead of chasing, over, chasing after the individual, let's go to large institutions who already have their clients, and we can provide a service for them. And that saved us. Otherwise, I would have been back on that Peugeot going back to South Africa. The first thing we did was come up with a solution for motor vehicle insurance. Uh, it's compulsory. You can't get a, a vehicle license without proof of cover. And it was all done on a paper-based system. And Zimbabweans, uh, besides being well-educated, have got the highest percentage of PhDs in Photoshop. They can make any piece of paper look like anything. <laughs> and we developed a unique platform that all insurance companies log on to to issue the policy and integrated it through sharing APIs with the licensing authority that they could query to see that this was a genuine policy issued by a genuine insurance company. And that really became a game changer for us. So what we did was we integrated into all the players. The MNOs on the one side with their wallets, which are very, today 90 plus percent of all transactions happen on EcoCash and Zim. We integrated into ZimSwitch, which is the switch for a domestic card, which most people have in Zimbabwe. There are very few Visa MasterCards there. And we've integrated into the banks so that our apps and our solutions through the APIs integrate interoperably and seamlessly and in most cases in real time. Just briefly, some of the solutions that we've provided. Um, I don't know that those who have been to Africa, you'll see there are many, many street vendors. Uh, the city of Harare has approximately 10,000, they didn't even know that number, that come into the city each day and sell their wares. They didn't know who they were, but more importantly, they couldn't collect the daily license fee. Uh, we developed a system for them where we registered the owners, gave them a database, and each day we do a run and deduct the license fee. If they have the money in the account, it gets deducted. If they don't, it goes into a separate wallet that they know exactly what each person owes, the data system that we gave to them. Enforcement officers can go around, they scan the QR code on the, on the card, and they can see if that person's up to date or what they owe, and they can take a payment. It's really been a big change for them. Zanara is the, um, the road authority in Zimbabwe. Um, with the shortage of cash, people didn't have the physical money to pay for the toll. We have some transport companies that spend between ten dollars to $15,000 a day with their trucks going you know, through Zimbabwe. It couldn't afford to have a transponder like you have in most Western countries where you could just beep through a toll gate. So it had come up with something that was affordable. And this is in the form of a plastic card where people could get the card register the vehicles that are associated with this, they do it themselves, and then they load value through the different APIs onto the card, it gets to the toll booth, they scan the QR code, it sees that that's the vehicle associated with the card, less than three seconds the transaction's done. That's the kind of stuff that we've, we've had to do. Up until now, there was no online payment gateway for a Zim switch card. So there was no online uh, e-commerce, which is crazy. Uh, We've just launched this now, where people can go online, renew their motor vehicle insurance, choose to renew their license, and even get it delivered to their house. This is unprecedented, probably in Africa, but certainly in Zimbabwe. It's really been a game changer. <clears throat> Tobacco. One wouldn't think that such pretty leaves and flowers can make people cough so much, but it certainly does. Tobacco is the largest export crop in Zimbabwe. The quality is, for some reason, very good. They're going to export $750 million worth of tobacco this year, a very significant part of a small economy. Um, the auction floor has asked us to develop a trading system for them, which starts from the farm gate, collecting the bale, all the way through chain of custody, but more importantly, financial settlement. Uh, buyers have to pre-fund the account with ICECash, and unless they've got money in the account when they're on the auction floor buying off their app, the transaction doesn't go through. So provided the money's there, they can bid, and settlement happens in real time. Again, completely unprecedented. The farmer gets an SMS to tell him what's happened. They can also log on and see exactly where they are in the whole process. Running out of time rapidly. <laughs> Taxis, the taxi solution, and this is mass transit in 
Zimbabwe and most African countries. It's highly decentralized. Um, Western countries, it's owned by one, normally the government. Yeah, each vehicle can literally be owned by a different person. And what we're trying to do there, uh, at the moment it's all cash, and we've developed an Oyster card solution that in each uh, vehicle, they can uh, tap onto that, and that is linked to the owner's account, and it creates a whole um, system where they get, the owners actually get each fare that's done with this. Lastly, um, is that we've been awarded the contract for the National Livestock Identification Program. And this entails registering each farmer. There's 600,000 farmers. These are small communal farmers and about 6.5 million head of cattle. Each farmer gets a card and each animal gets an RFID tag put in their ear and that tag is linked to uh, the card. Aside from traceability, disease control, anti-stock theft, what's most important is that we have a module which enables the banks to register a lien over the animals. So suddenly you've got an asset which is totally unleveraged um, that farmers can now use as collateral. In Africa, the number of cattle that you own represents your wealth. This is a very important thing and we've just completed phase one. We've, we've, we've tagged 90 to 100,000 animals which our company paid for, so now the proof of concept's done. And it's about to roll out throughout the country. Clearly, funding of this is critical because it's, the tags are expensive, etc. But we've had a good response, very, very good response from government and also the donor community as well. So I'm out of time. I've got a short video which just really explains this, but um, I think this just gives you a sense of the kind of solutions that we've had to come up with out of necessity. Um, and it's certainly been an interesting ride for me. And, most importantly, a lot of these things are actually changing people's lives, which as an entrepreneur in the autumn of my business career is very fulfilling for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barry. Very inspiring. Uh, maybe time for, for one or two questions? What would be these things jump around. Your one piece of advice to today's audience based on your experience. Follow Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> um, is Icecash uh, mobile P2P payments? Um, yeah, we do both. So we certainly do P2P. Um, we've also, and I didn't have time to go through it, we've got a, an app solution. Uh, we have a micro-lending solution for SMEs. Uh, in Africa, micro-loans are only given to government civil servants because they can do a payroll deduction. This app is done to SMEs where in their shops they use the app to process all their transactions and that goes back to repay the loan. Uh, one of our clients is the largest FMG uh, supplier there and he gives his clients day loans, which really enables them, where working capital is so tight, they can really um, up their turnover considerably because they can buy goods every single day based on the loan that they get, which gets repaid each day and can only spend it in the store. I don't know on time. Okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Barry. you very much. Thank you. Well done.